Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, as Sean said, I'm here today to talk about how to get involved in the Django development process. Now, I'll get to some specifics in a little bit, but um, some of the specifics make a lot more sense if I can put some of this stuff into some sort of framing, put it, give it a bit of context. So I'd like to start with a rhetorical question. What is Django? Now, it's very, very easy to say Django is the web, web framework for perfectionists with deadlines. You know, it's the great advertising copy. And from a technical standpoint, from an advertising standpoint, you'd be completely correct. But I'd like to suggest that there's another answer that's just as valid and from the point of view of the development process is, is much more important. Django is a community. There are all sorts of differences between open source uh, software and proprietary software, but the biggest difference to my mind is actually cultural. Commercial software, you go and you pay your license fee, you get your shrink, shrink wrap box, you get your official support line that you can complain on and then get ignored on. You're a customer and there's a service provider. It's a very, very traditional model of commerce. But you get absolutely no control. You can complain to the, into the line on the phone as much as you like, but ultimately it's the guy, the, the service provider, who makes the decisions and that's the end of, that's the, end of the story. If enough of you complain enough, maybe they'll, they'll turn the boat around. There's no control, but the lack of control is at least obvious. In open source, there's a product and there's a core team who on superficially may appear like they're a service provider, and, but you do have control. So because you've got all the source code and you've got access to the source code repository. So it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that this means that everyone can just tell the core team what to do and hey, we'll just move this boat around. But the thing is, it's not how it works. We're a community. And just because the core team has the commit bit, that doesn't mean they're on call to support you in particular, or to, to fix your problems. Now that doesn't mean that your problems aren't important or that your problems don't need to be solved, but what it, it means that you can't start with the assumption that the service provider, who in Django's case, uh, 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 in most cases in open source projects, are volunteers, are going to jump to fix your specific problem or respond to your feedback specifically. If you've got a commercial support contract, yeah, you're paying for someone to answer your questions, but our open source community, we all need to work together to make stuff happen. Getting people to understand, really, really understand that core difference is one of the biggest reasons that people get frustrated trying to, op uh, trying to engage in open source and why people who run open source projects get frustrated with the people who talk to them. You really need to grok the fact that you are part of a community and everyone needs to work together to make things happen. Just demanding that someone else fixes your problem specifically isn't gonna get anything done. A good analogy for a lot of open source is a community garden. Everyone is welcome to help. We've got the space, we've got some plants growing. Some people started it off by, by, by planting a few, a few vegetables, planting a few flowers. And we want everyone to come along and help and make this garden a prettier, happier place and do all, uh, um, uh, at, so that we can, we can all benefit from, from what comes out. What do we have to do? Well, sometimes there are weeds that need to be pulled. Sometimes there are flowers and vegetables that need to be picked. It's seasonal. And, and the people who are running the garden or the people who, who are part of this garden community need your help. And in the end, everybody who, who joins in benefits. Yes, there are community leaders. Generally, they're the people who have either started the project in the first place or the people who have put in the most time over time. But those community leaders need the community as much as the community needs the community leaders to, in order to get anything done. And like all gardens, it's possible to aspire to perfection, but in reality, there's no such thing. Even the most pristine English country garden still has snails and insects. And the community garden, there's even more snails and insects, but there are also helpful people who, with the best of intentions, turn up, fertilize the weeds, and poison the roses. And it's the job of the community as a whole to self-manage, to try and keep those problems to a minimum, and to educate those who are coming into the community about the community standards and about the way things get done, so that they, everyone, everyone who comes to the community has the opportunity to become valuable, contributing members. It also means that you reap what you sow. Just because you turn up one day with a great big bag of fertilizer doesn't mean you get to take home a bag of radishes. This isn't a farmer's market, it isn't commerce. Just because you've paid doesn't mean you get to take home exactly what you want right away today. There may not be any radishes available. The radishes that are available might have already been allocated to someone who's been volunteering on the project for months. Now, no one forces you to contribute to open source, I'd like, to consider, uh, I'd like to suggest that what people need to do is get off the fence and start contributing to the project as a whole. Stop looking at, this, look, stop looking at the problem of, I need my bug fixed, and look at, start looking at it as, how can I help contribute to the community, one of the offshoot, uh, offshoots of which maybe eventually my problem gets fixed. So, that's the abstract answer. Let's make it real. 
Django needs you. How can I get you off the fence? So here, presented today, my five-step program for becoming a core developer. Step one, contribute to mailing lists. Step two, triage tickets. Step three, get involved in feature development. Step four, propose new features of your own. Step five, you get the commit bit. Now, looking at sort of the patterns that emerge of people who get involved in Django as a community, I've noticed a sort of four basic patterns. There are those who never go beyond use. They download the software, they use the software. Um, they, you know, they, that's fine. They, they, that's part of the open source contract. You are free to do that. Um, they just quietly go about their business, use the software. A lot of, the, one of the, the great ironies of, of Django's mailing list is that, yes, Django users has 22,700 members on it. Almost everyone I know that uses Django in a professional context isn't on Django users. They just use the software. They don't participate in the community. And that's fine. I'd like to advocate, I have advocated a couple of times during this, com uh, during this conference, that maybe you should perhaps consider giving back in other ways, either financially or by giving resources or trying to convince your boss to donate money or resources. But, you know, that's part of the contract. You're not required to give it anything. I just, I would like to, like to say, please consider it very, very hard if you, are, if you are in that position. Type two, you get people who try something really, really huge. They try to get some new feature, some massive bug fix. They make some huge effort. It, doesn't, it fails to, to take off straight away, and they give up and go away. And that's disappointing, because they've put in a whole lot of effort. We don't want people ever to want people to waste their effort, but we don't have a way of, it, it, they, they haven't been successful in getting their thing in there, so okay, we need to work out how to minimize that, that loss. Type three, we've got people who start something very, very small, don't see success, and give up. So these, they haven't put in quite as much time and effort as the person who produced a huge patch, but they haven't seen immediate success, so they've walked away. And the fourth are people who try something small, persist, and over time succeed. The fourth is the model for the five-step program here. You really do need to keep being persistent. It's not about finding one thing, getting gratification, and moving on, although we'd very much like to do anything we can to, satisfy, to, to, to make sure everybody does get satisfied. The people who genuinely are successful are the people who are persistent. We want more people to succeed. We want more people to become active members of the Django community, like I say. I am a core developer on Django, but that doesn't mean that I'm better than anyone. It just means that I'm the guy who's got the commit bit. And I need everyone in here as much as you need me to commit the code. So, okay, let's work through our five-step program. Step one, the mailing lists. Getting involved in the mailing list is probably the easiest place you could possibly get started in contributing to the Django community. It requires almost no commitment whatsoever. You just answer as many questions as you can spare the time to, commit, spare the time to answer. And although it doesn't sound like it's like a really big contribution, it really is a huge help. And it's not a complete waste of time either. Some of the best contributions you can make are not code. Okay? Contributing to the mailing list is a great way to know, get to know the other members of the community. If you are brand new to the Django community, start answering questions on Django, uh, Django users. Pretty soon you'll start if you're reading, reading Django users and answering on Django users. You'll start to know who the people in the community are because they're answering questions as well. Lots of long-term contributors to Django still frequent Django users and answer questions. It's also a great way of introducing yourself to the community to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. You're not just some random stranger, you're someone who does have extensive experience in solving caching problems or extensive, problem, extensive experience with design issues or whatever your area of expertise is. Everyone is well-meaning, but some people are more experienced than others and being able to demonstrate that you are someone with experience is very helpful. I don't know how many of people in this room have ever spent any time uh, actually teaching someone. I, I, my undergrad degree, I had, a, had the uh, opportunity to be a tutor um, through my degree and then in postgraduate um, that continued in teaching courses and teaching lectures, uh, teaching, uh, teaching units. Teaching something, teaching someone is probably the single best way to solidify your understanding of anything. Because in order to explain it to someone else, you have to understand it really well. Answering questions on Django users is a great way to make you a better Django programmer. And if you're on Django dev, explaining a technical aspect of some design that you want to try to get through, or explaining the technical problem behind a bug that you've, that you've got, is really, really great practice. I've seen any number of surveys of employer, um, uh, employer desired attributes in, you know, uh, uh, in new hires. And communication skills regularly out trumps technical skill. Because when you go to work for an employer, you need to communicate with everyone else in the company. Django Dev, it's a great way to get, your, to get practice, costs you nothing. 
a little bit of etiquette. When you are on Django users, when you are on Django dev, when you are on IRC, your behavior reflects on everyone in the community. So please communicate like that. Communicate professionally. Talk like a human who has taken the time to compose their message, aware of the fact that when you post a response, you are effectively asking 22,700 people to read your response. And take notes. Do you notice, a sorry, when, when you do um, uh, um, respond on the mailing list, remember that everyone needs to start somewhere, everyone has different experience, and it's usually safe to assume that people aren't idiots. Occasionally, language problems can appear as, as idiocy. I put it to an, to an audience of people who are predominantly English speaking, English native speaking, that the people who are not native English speakers who are responding on Django users have much better English than your Portuguese, Chinese, French, Spanish, whatever it is their native language is. Be aware of the fact that they have taken a huge risk and put themselves out there trying to speak in a second language. Give them the benefit of the doubt because possibly the issue that you've got is just a communication issue. There's a big difference between saying, that doesn't make any sense, you moron, and I'm not sure I understood your question, can you perhaps rephrase? One of them makes the Django community seem open. One of them makes the Django community seem like a bunch of, bunch of assholes. And take notes. Do you notice a common theme popping up in, in, in mailing lists? Maybe it's a documentation issue. Do you notice a common problem that everyone is, is having? Maybe that's a feature in the making. This sort of data mining is really, really valuable because it, if, you can, if you can point out the fact that there is this trend occurring, maybe some of the core team haven't noticed that trend occurring. If you can point to the 15 threads in the last week that have pointed out something, then yeah, that's a problem we need to address. Maybe we should put in giving some more attention to that. And that kind of data mining is something that you only really be able to do if you're actively participating in the mailing lists. Okay, so. We've all started contributing to the mailing list. We've hit level one. We've got our little little token or whatever it is you get with the NAA. Um, we move on to level two of the program. You start getting involved in the ticket tracker. Okay, if you go to code.djangoproject.com, there is a track instance. Track is not the best ticket tracker in the world, but it is at least as not awful as any of the others that are available. Um, and so we've got some history with it. We're sticking with it for the moment. Okay, you go there, and what you will find is Track. It is a fairly vanilla track instance with a couple of little plug-ins plug to make it integrate nicely with Git. Um, if anybody is interested in becoming a full-time track monkey and wants to help, can help the Django project, coming and helping us with our track instance would be awesome. I know there are many people that would like to you know, push this off to someone else. Um, so yeah, track is a way of tracking the bugs that are coming into the system. Keeping, keeping discussions on, uh, on what's going on with, the, with different issues, with different features that are being, um, uh, being proposed. Uh, closing them out over time, seeing why, why certain problems occurred, all that sort of thing. There is plenty to do. As of Sunday, which is when I, when I last updated these, these stats, there were 1,935 open tickets, 80 of them awaiting triage. That means there are 80 tickets that have been put into Django's ticket tracker that no one has even looked at yet. We have no idea if they're valid, invalid, uh, uh, represent a major problem, represent the fact that someone can't read the docs, represent the fact that someone didn't understand the docs, so there's something that needs to be clarified. There are 701 patches that, those are tickets that need a patch. That is, there's an issue there, but no one has provided any code to fix the problem. 25 of those are labeled easy pickings, which means that there is a, there is a, a flag in the database that says someone has qualified this as being probably a fairly easy problem to fix. 25 of them are probably one-line patches. There are 877 patches awaiting review. So there are people who have gone in, written a patch for a block of code, or for, to fix a problem, to add a feature, and no one's, no one's gone, gone on and said, yes, okay, I'm gonna look at those, that patch and say, yes, that's a good patch. There are 407 patches that have been looked at, and someone has said, no, there's a problem with this patch, and no one's gone and updated the patch to improve, to, to, to address the issues that were, that, were, that were pointed out. 204 patches that need documentation, 284 patches that need tests. We are very, very aggressive about having documentation for any new feature and having tests for a regression test for any um, feature addition or bug fix that's introduced into the suite. Okay, Django has a very large test suite. It's the thing that keeps us sane whenever we make any big changes, like to the ORM. So, how do you get involved? Pick an area of interest. You know, if you, are, you have an interest in the ticket in the uh, templating system, you can filter tickets. You go search, for view, search the list of tickets. You can search tickets by, by area. Show me all the tickets that relate to the template system. 
update the filter, okay, we're down to a smaller list. Pay attention, oh, sorry, once, once you've got, it, got that list, you can then just start working through the list. Start, start the low numbers, work your way through. Context, however, matters. Low ticket numbers, if you're down to a ticket number that's in like two digits, three, di three digits, there's almost certainly some very bad mojo history in there. There is a reason that ticket is still open. Try and see if you can work out what the reason is. There is always a discussion after the ticket, and that will usually fill out the blanks. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes you'll need to go and search Django Dev and sort of see if there's, if there's more discussion or history going on. Um, and if all else fails, try and grab someone on IRC or ask on the mailing list, I've had seen this ticket, it's old, can anyone fill me in on the backstory? Pay attention to who's commented as well. Um, the core developer or anyone who is a core developer is flagged on the, in, in track discussion, so they'll have their name and a little label that says core developer. So you'll have an idea of if someone of significance to the community has made a comment, is a little bit, carries a little bit more weight than if a random anonymous person has made a, made a comment. Doesn't necessarily mean the core person is right and the anonymous person is wrong, but it means that there is someone who is, has the commit bit that needs to be convinced, which from a community management point of view is kind of the thing we need to, we need to get. Be bold, okay? We're not a, we, we don't bite, we're nice people. Um, you know, we don't bite unless you ask. Um, but don't be too bold, okay? There's, there's a middle ground here. Don't be paralyzed into inaction, but don't charge in like a bull in, the char, in a bull in the china shop. If you don't know or you're not sure, no harm whatsoever in leaving a comment saying, I've looked at this ticket and I think it's okay, but I'm not sure. Can someone validate this for me? Because if you leave that comment, the next person who comes along and looks at it, and they think, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right too. Enough, I'm not sure's, but I think so, turns into, yeah, okay, well, let's just go with that. I'd also add that, like, me too isn't feedback. Contribute to the knowledge, not the noise. If it's a me too, if I'm, I'm like, yes, I really want this feature, that's kind of helpful. Why do you really need this feature is more helpful, okay? So we're looking to develop the amount of knowledge that's here. Be rigorous. Like I said, we are aggressive about, about PEP8. We're aggressive about docs. We're aggressive about tests. And when I say we're aggressive about, about PEP8, it's also important to remember the preamble statement that says uh, that I've, uh, 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 a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of the little minds. That's an important part of PEP8. A patch that makes everything 80 characters wide, whilst may give you a very deep sense of satisfaction, is not necessarily something that's important from the community as a whole. Also important, don't just stop at one, okay? Start slow, don't just rush in and, and, and triage 100 tickets in one sitting, but do triage more than one. Triage a couple. Start slow, don't, don't wait for a little pat in the head to say, yes, you've done a good thing there. Try one, try another, try another. Over time, you can sort of build a cadence and see, okay, yeah, I, I, I can see how this is going. Anyone, you don't also don't have to worry too much about offending anyone because anyone who really, who, who really cares about the ticket system, so most of the core team, for example, subscribe to a, a feed of every update that happens to track. One of the my, my routines every morning, get a cup of coffee, sit down, read my mail, and in my mail is every update that was made to track last night. Now, most of them I don't read in great detail, but I will keep a scan for what's going on. And if I see someone's making a lot of comments, and they seem to be missing the point, I will jump onto a ticket and say, yeah, okay, thanks for the enthusiasm, but I think you maybe need to slow down and pay attention to this detail or something like that, okay? Don't worry about making mistakes. Because we, al we have deliberately, this is a community garden, we allow anyone to edit anything in track. Nothing in track is irreversible. If you want to help, we want your help. And we've set up the system such that if you do something wrong, it's not catastrophic. We assume that everyone is well-intentioned. You're not just coming in here and you know, trying to mess up our track, with the exception of the spammers who I very, very badly want to kick in the gonads, but that's a whole other issue. The guiding principle on all of our track activity is that we are looking for two pairs of eyes. There's a person who submits a bug, a person who submits a ticket, and then we need someone to confirm that the ticket is real. We have someone who submits, an uh, submits a patch, and we need someone to confirm that the patch is valid. And essentially, all we're really looking for, for any progression of anything in the ticket system, is two sets of eyes. If we can get two independent people in the Django community to agree that this is good, then that's enough for us to move to the next step. Now, at some point, that may, we may get two people who do, do very much agree that this is right, and it gets to the final stage, and the core committer says, no, we're missing something. In which case, we'll just move it back a step, 
not a problem. No one's harmed. We now know what, what was missing from this, from, 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 no, this, this was missing some critical aspect or doesn't handle this edge case. We move it back one step. We go through the process again. We get two sets of eyes that agree that the, 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 all the criteria have been met. The criticism of the core team member has been met and we move it back up again. Like the community garden, we appreciate the mistakes can be made. The important thing isn't to never make a mistake. It's just to never make the same mistake twice. Okay? We have absolutely no problem with the fact that well-intentioned people come into, the track, come into track and do something that is wrong by the book. We only have an issue when having done something wrong and being told they've done something wrong, do it again and again and again. Try to avoid doing that, please. So, what can you do when you're in the ticket system? You can triage new tickets. This is extraordinarily important and is probably the single largest piece of work that holds up Django releases. We can't cut a release until the triage list has zero tickets in it. Because we don't know if someone has reported a feature in 1.5 or in the, in the betas and the alphas for 1.5 unless we have read every ticket and confirmed that we haven't caused a major problem. So we need people to triage these tickets what does triaging mean? It means that you need to validate the problem actually exists. Person has described the problem. Does this problem actually exist or is it in their own fancied imagination? Have they provided clear instructions on how to reproduce the problem? If the ticket description doesn't give you the ability to say, yes, I can also make this bug happen, then it's not a complete bug report. And we've either got to leave it open and say, hey, can you provide more detail? Or close it off to say, no, this problem doesn't exist. It's just in your fevered imagination. Having got some, if you can then reproduce the problem, okay, we're off to the races. We've got a genuine problem here. Can you turn that into a test case? Django, like I say, we have a, if you, some of you find a bug, we need a regression test to make sure the bug doesn't come back later on. The way you reproduce the problem will often be we write a project, we generate a template, and now, hey, if we put value X into the template, then the template raises an exception that it shouldn't raise. We need to be able to do that in a programmatic test case. If you can turn a set of written instructions into a programmatic test case, that's a huge help. Because all of a sudden we've got something we can put in the test suite that when that passes, the bug can be, can be closed off. Check the metadata of the ticket. The person has described this bug. Have they, and, and one, there's a bunch of other flags that are on the ticket to say, this is something that is easy pickings. Does it look like it's a really easy problem? Has it been reported against the right component of the system? If someone's reporting a database problem and it's flagged as being a template issue, okay, that's not going to help us find the problem again later on. Are there any other magic keywords or tags that we can put onto this to make it easy to find later on? Make sure all those, those flags are up to date. Once you've done those things, once you've validated the problem exists, we've got a good set of instructions, or at least you've elaborated the instructions to, to clarify exactly how the problem can be reproduced, Mark the ticket as accepted. Pull down the box, accepted, done. Ticket's been triaged. Or, if it is just a problem that's in the, in the, the uh, ticket submitter's fevered imagination, mark it as closed, explain your reasoning. I don't, think this is your, I don't think you're reading the documentation correctly. The documentation clearly says that this will raise an exception. Here's the reference. Thanks for the, thanks for the report. Again, being friendly, being open, inviting them to reopen the ticket in the case of um, uh, in, in the case of, you know, if you think we've done this in error, feel free to reopen. Um, and if occasionally we do get people that log on to, onto track and say, answer, ask a question that should probably be uh, actually asked on Django users. It's not, you know, track is not a customer support channel, it's a ticket tracker. So direct them politely to go to Django users and mark the ticket as closed. Okay, so. We've triaged our tickets. Once they're triaged, they move into a state of, accept of being accepted, and we're now basically waiting for someone to fix the problem. So, finding a ticket that has a patch, apply the patch. Does the patch apply? If it doesn't, then the patch needs improvement. Tick the, t tick the metadata, you're done. If the patch exists, does it have documentation? Does it have tests? Does it need documentation? If it's not a new feature, it probably doesn't need documentation. Check that the test actually verifies the fix. You'd be surprised how many people submit a patch that contains a test that passes both before and after the, the, the rest of the code has been applied. So we need a test that fails before and passes afterwards. And check that the fix seems appropriate. You know, there are all sorts of ways you can make a test pass. It's, it's, trivially, it's, it's absolutely trivial to make a test that is 100% passing and completely useless. And likewise, to make a patch that is 100% makes the test pass, but in no way fixes the problem that's being described. If you are convinced, you've looked at this code, say, yeah, that looks to be exactly right. Mark the ticket is ready for check-in. We've now got two pairs of eyes that have validated 
We've looked at one person has submitted a ticket, a ticket, they've submitted a patch, they're satisfied, you're satisfied they've done the right thing, move it to ready to check in, that puts it on the core team's shoulders. And we've got a pre-validated, here's a list of tickets that people say are ready to go. You can also update tickets. Find all the old problems. Do they still exist? Like I say, this is a community garden. So there are tickets that were reported three years ago, and they were reported again two and a half years ago, and then they were reported again two years ago. This happens. You know, it's, we, we aren't perfect. There are reproductions that occur. So does the problem still exist? Is there a duplicate of this ticket already in the system? Does someone already know this problem exists and someone's just re-reporting because they, didn't use, they couldn't, couldn't find the, the existing ticket? If, you've, if you do find an old patch, or fi find an old ticket, and the problem still seems to exist, and you can validate that this, you know, the test case still fails, or the problem they describe still exists, if there's a patch, does the patch still apply? Patches, you know, patches do, do experience bit rot. You know, over time, the, the source code changes. So you, know, you need to be able to make check this patch still applies. And if it doesn't, can you update the patch so that it does apply? Are there any other related tickets? This is another one of those things about data mining. Okay, if you find, if you, if you mine, uh, um, oh, sorry, put a, put a good example in the case here. Um, ben Fershman discovered a long time ago that he did a bit of data mining and discovered that the uh, um, syndication framework had lots and lots and lots of little bugs. He was able to pull them all together, identify the root cause, and actually fix the problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and submitted a patch that closed off 15, 20 tickets in one, in one hit. Finding those rich veins of, of tickets that need to be closed out is a great way of maximizing the effectiveness of the core team. You can say, I, when I sit down to actually work on, a, on an area, uh, to work on Django, I'm quite frequently looking for, okay, I want to work on all the tickets in the template system today. Because once you get your head into the internals of the template system, you know where you're going, you can stay in that mind space, you can keep turning around. If someone's pre-qualified 10 tickets that you can look at in one sitting, awesome. That means you, know, you don't have to go looking for the 10 problems you're going to solve. So if you can make that rich vein, you make the core team's job a whole lot easier. So like I say, look for common themes. Are there particular areas, I mean, beyond the obvious, there are bugs in the ORM, you know, can you find a specific area, a specific class of problem that seems to generate a lot of problems? Prior to 1.0, which says before the query set refactor landed, one of the reasons we did the query set refactor is there were lots and lots of little bugs around order by. And the way that order by would interact with select related. And the, the solution ultimately wasn't to just individually patch each, these one, each, uh, each and every one of these little problems. It was to fix the root problems that order by and select related really didn't, weren't implemented right. Let's, let's go fix that, close out a whole bunch of tickets at once. If you do do this data mining activity, post to Django Dev. Any intelligence we can get about what's in our track database, absolutely fantastic to have. And it makes an easy target for us as core developers. Okay, and of course the obvious thing, the one thing that everyone comes to Django to say, hey, I want to fix, you know, I want to help out, you can actually fix problems. There are tickets, that, or tickets in the system that do not have patches, or that do not have patches that have all the properties that they require. Fix them. Find a ticket that's an area you're interested in and write the patch that fixes the problem. Don't forget the documentation, Doc, you don't forget the tests. And when you have finished uploading your patch or doing it on GitHub, submitting a pull request, put the pull request information into the, into the track ticket, um, Check the metadata, say, okay, yes, this ticket now has a patch. No, it doesn't need documentation. No, it doesn't need test. Submit. A slight aside, please, for the love of all that is holy, don't submit security issues to track. There is a great big warning message that says this when you submit the ticket, and yet it still happens. Tell your friends, if you have a security problem, if you suspect you have a security problem, if you suspect your suspicion may be that you have a security problem, mail it to security at djangoproject.com. That is an off, off public uh, eyes list where we will internally say, okay, yes, this is a security problem and we're going to address it. We would much rather have false positives on security issues than have our security issues reported in the wild on track. So, if you mail security at djangoproject.com, you should get a response from one of the core team within 24 hours. The response will usually be, yes, we've seen this, okay, thanks very much for the report, we're looking into it. It may be, no, nah, honestly, that's not, not a real problem, you can report that to track, we'll just treat it as a, as a, as a documentation issue or something like that. Um, when you make the announcement, if it turns out you have found a legitimate problem, we will keep you in the loop. 
We will work, work through our, our usual security procedures. We will generate a patch. We will give you a copy of the patch that you can validate that the problem fixes what you think it, or what, that you, you agree that the patch fixes what it should. We also pre-announce to certain parties. So um, if you are, for example, the, ma the maintainer of Django for a Linux distribution, let us know. We will put you on the list. If you can demonstrate that your company that you're representing or whatever has a significant security procedures or has serious security procedures, has its own internal mailing list for dealing with security issues, we're happy to consider putting you on the list. There are also major companies that we are willing to do this for as well. So for example, Mozilla. We notify Mozilla if we find a major security problem. If you think you need to be on that list, if you think you have a large Django installation which would be embarrassing to Django as a project if a bug was found in the wild in your, in your app, come and talk to us, make an application, tell us what you think your, you know, your give us your security credentials, let us know what, how you handle security internally and we'll consider putting you on the pre-announced list. Okay, feature development. Um, Big patches need feedback. Okay, this is not you yourself proposing a feature. This is the idea of um, providing design feedback, code feedback to features that are being added to Django by other people. Okay, I'm currently working on uh, the pluggable auth user model. Okay, I need help. I'm not the only person who works on this. If you want to contribute, the right way you can contribute is to try out the code and find all the problems that you think you can find. Let me know about them. Help write documentation. Help write tests. They're not fun to write. I don't like writing them. Any help you can give me is great. Read on Django Dev to find where help is needed. You will usually find anyone who's working on a new feature will be saying, hey, here's a new version of the patch. Can someone take it for a spin? And the biggest thing, propose a new feature all of its own. Please don't start here. I know this is the most tempting thing to do. I'm so excited. I'm new to Django and I can just, I can just taste it. Django would be awesome if only it had this. Your first contribution, if your first contribution is a 20,000 line patch to change everything, it's just, you're not going to get the momentum to move on, okay? As an indication of how hard and how important adding new big major features to Django is, delivering a major new feature is usually one of the things we use as a job interview for getting the commit, tick, uh, the commit bit, okay? Submitting that one really big patch is what gets you there. If you do, if you must propose a new feature, implementation trumps idle talk. But before you start wasting all your time writing a great big patch, put up a test balloon. Ask if, you know, is anyone interested in X? Ask yourself the question, does it have to be in core or could it be kept externally? Try writing a sample implementation. Drive the discussion. Part of this thing, you need to be pushing the discussion consistently because if you just put a patch there, it's going to get forgotten because we're all living, bit, bit, everyone's leading busy lives. One, mailing li one, one discussion on a mailing list gets forgotten unless you've like, act, threatened to set fire to someone's shoelaces. And if possible, find a champion. Find someone in the core team who cares about what you care about. Because that then, then gives you the person in the core team who probably will ultimately end up committing your code. One good model for getting features into trunk, consolidate existing community efforts. Find existing implementations of the feature you want. If you can demonstrate there are 15 other implementations of this feature on track, but sorry, out, out in the wild, maybe that's something we should look to see if there is a common implementation. Is there commonality we can work towards? Build a unified branch. And also, document things. If you want to get a feature into Django, particularly if it's a big feature, having the design process documented is really valuable. Have a look at the wiki pages for contrib.messages, for CSRF, for auth.user. They are long wiki pages. But if you want to know why CSRF is the way it is, we can point you at that and say, here's the decisions we made. A lot of people, after the landing of class-based views, said, why did you do it this way? He said, well, this is why we did it this way. Here's all the reasons. You may not agree with them, but we looked at these. These were the trade-offs. This was the pluses. These were the minuses, and this is what we did. Also, remember, this is Django in 2012. Django is boring. This is a good thing. We don't want excitement in production. We want boring, because boring means we get to go to sleep. If you have sweeping changes for Django, they're just not going to happen, okay? Unless you can give us a way of moving forward in a very clean, sedate, calm manner. You know, Django is being used by some very large organizations that are not going to turn on a dime. Backwards compatibility matters, and it's one of the reasons why Django, at least in my mind, why Django is so successful. We are aggressive about backwards compatibility, or at least providing a path forward 
for, the, for these backwards compatibility issues. Also, I do want to take a moment here and say, I've obviously been con focusing on code contributions with the aim of people becoming core contributors, but it's not just about code and it's not just about the core. Yes, we want people to contribute to Django's core because obviously that's the thing at the core that makes the difference at the end of the day. But there's a much bigger community out there. You may be able to make your contribution to Django not on Django's core. Make it an external package that you take time to look after. Make it a community website that you take the time to look after. Make it a community group that you take time to look after. There are lots of things you can do in the community that involve nothing to do with Django's core. And we want those people to exist because we need to distribute the load. Okay, pushing everything into Django's core is not the way to make this as a community successful. Okay, so why did I say smart start small? Communities are all about building trust. We know that everyone comes to Django with the very best of intentions, but some people just aren't a good fit. Either technical fit, they don't have the experience, they believe in different things, or culturally they, have it, they, they, they value different properties. People, some people in this world do not value backwards compatibility because they like rapid prototyping, they like to be able to change things very rapidly, and that's fine. That's a perfectly valid set of, set of conditions. It's just not Django. So we need, to find, we need to build trust. People come to Django, we don't know you yet. We need to know you, we want to know you because we want you to become part of this community. With some exceptions, there are no absolutes. You know, PHP, mm, okay, we can all agree it's not a good idea. But Python versus Ruby, you know, it's just a matter of taste. Django has a flavor. Coming to a discussion and saying Django would be great if only it was completely different just isn't going to fly. When you propose something, when you come into a discussion room, you need to establish that what you're proposing has fit. It has a good cultural fit. And the more we know about you, the more you've interacted with us in the past, we understand your motivations, we understand why you're saying certain things, the better, the easier it is for you to contribute. So help us to get to know you. Trust is not something you can buy. Trust is something that builds over time. Lots of little actions build up to trust in the long term. And trust me, they will get noticed. I noticed Imeric a long time before he got the commit bit because he was just there. He was reviewing tickets, working over and over and over again. And he's sort of the person you're sitting there saying, I just wanna give this guy a hug because he's making my life so much better. It's also an issue of practicality. The only way I get anything done is to ignore 99% of the things that pass over my desk. Now that doesn't mean that the that 99% isn't important and I would love to give every proposal, every ticket, every mailing list message my full attention. I just can't. I'm sorry, I'm human. There are only 24 hours in the day and I need to sleep for some of them. How do you improve the chance that your ticket hits my 1%? Make me trust you. Make me want to help you. I will move heaven and earth. If Alex, uh, Jacob, I'm Eric, um, any, anyone on the core team comes to me and says, hey, can you review this patch? I'll move heaven and earth because they've done things for me in the past. Karma, karma, come, karma, karma comes around, you know. We're communal animals. We want to build relationships. All patches aren't created equal. All contributors aren't, contribu aren't created equal. But it's very, very easy to build that trust. You just need to be there for the long haul. I'd also like to finish up by basically pointing at this quote from the West Wing. Don't know how many of you are fans, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of the West Wing. And towards the end of, I think it's like, first season, there's an episode where um, the president stands up and he, he, uh, uh, he's being questioned by uh, a girl from, from university, or a woman from university, and he makes the comment, decisions are made by those who show up. In the past, the core team, I will absolutely concede, was a very hard group to get into, um, and we got called on that. Eric Florenzano stood up two years ago at DjangoCon and called us on it. We've learned from that mistake. We have been adding a lot of core developers in the last couple of years. Hey, we've added two in the last week. Um, there, but these people, the people we're adding to the core team, aren't there because they did something great last week. They're here because they were doing something great last week, and the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that. It's a community. We need everyone's help, but we need everyone's help to be there for the long haul. So, it's time to get off the fence. We've got our community garden. We need someone to come help. help. Get off the fence. Any questions? Hi. Hi. I figured I'd come up since you can't come down and ask yourself a question. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sure I, I didn't manage. deliver that very well, though. I should have been more confident. Anyway, uh, so I'm wondering, you said that it's, it's really important that people who aren't writing code contribute. Has the... It's not so much that people who aren't writing code contribute, it's that there's lots of valuable contributions that aren't code. Okay, okay, okay yeah, lots of valuable countries. I like that better, the way you said it. Um, <laughs> so uh, has the core group considered giving something like commit to someone who's contributing in a big way that's not involving code? Okay, so the commit bit is effectively just out the, the one tangible artifact that we can give someone because they can affect the code base. If someone was to come into the community who just turned out to be the world's most awesome community manager um, with absolutely no coding skills whatsoever, um, I, we probably wouldn't give them the commit bit, but I'm willing to guarantee we'd find some way of blessing them in some formal fashion. You know, I mean, Steve and, and uh, Steve as the, form, as the, the sort of financial end and Sean as the non-financial end of DjangoCon, they do a great job. They're not in any way blessed by the Django project in the sense that they have the commit bit, but you know, if I need something organized in the community, I know I've got someone I can call on who's there. And I, everyone in this room you know, recognizes who Sean is because of the great works that he does, and Steve for the great works that he does. Do we need to put a formal badge on that? Um, possibly, but I don't know who it is that we're putting the badge on at this point, so. Um, yeah, it was a hypothetical question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so working for the University of Illinois, who uh, has been a little sensitive to open source ever since giving away Mosaic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't actually own my, my workday work, okay. but I do sometimes get to the talk to the people who get to make that call. Can you prime my elevator speech for, for why an organization like that should be more committed to open source? Oh. That's a hard one. So this is, this is an organization that has a history of contributing to open source, but got burnt by losing lots of money. Um, I suppose the argument that I would make is that whilst, yes, they possibly lost the billion dollars or whatever it was that they lost in not, being, not having shares in, in Netscape, um, they have helped in the development of an industry that is now worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And that drives a lot more in the aggregate, it means they made a lot more money. It's not obvious, you can't point to the line item and say, hey, look, here's our dividend check from Netscape. But you do have a much greater demand for web engineers who are coming to your university and paying fees, therefore, you know, the industry as a whole has benefited from the, ben from, from the contributions that was made, even though you gave up the once-off opportunity of making a great water cash. Um, I'm sure I could finesse that into something a little bit more, and if you are interested in helping finesse those arguments, um, one of the projects that we've sort of got as an adjunct to Django is, or to, to the to Django project, is this thing called Why Django, which is essentially the pointy head boss's arguments for why you should care about Django. Now, we've been looking at that primarily as, um, you know, I'm, I work for a multinational corporation and I need to build a website, why should I use Django instead of Rails, or why should I use Django instead of uh, .NET? Um, but the argument of why should I let my guys contribute to this open source project could probably also be a part of that um, quite well. So uh, if you want to help, help develop those arguments, build the flyer so that we can, you know, we've got something to give to your, your um, manager at U of I, then, um, you know, that'd be a great way to contribute. Thank you. That's great. Hi. Uh, you talked about uh, there are multiple patches that is, you know, waiting for reviewers. Uh, if we want to get in and you know start reviewing and, and doing that kind of stuff, what does that process look like? What do we need to do in order to review a patch and mark it as it's, it's valid or it's, it's good? Okay, so essentially what it comes down to is you get the code, you look at the code, you apply the patch, and you, okay, you, you apply the, you ap does the patch apply is, is step one. If it does apply, what does the patch do? You are a software engineer. You are at the point where you can apply a patch. We're going to assume that you've at least, you must be at least this high to get on this ride. If you can apply the patch, you are at least that high, so let's just take it a little further. Um, we need you to apply your brain to say, this looks like it is, yes, it is fixing the problem, and it's fixing it the right way. Looking around the code, becoming familiar with the code, yes, this looks like it is fixing the problem correctly. Other than, you need to be convinced. If you are happy to put your name next to it and say, I believe this is fixed, that's all we're looking for. Okay. 
Um, are there any IRC channels that we could go to to get help on the Django development specifically, not just Django users? Uh, yes, so there is a Jang, uh, hash Django dev, uh, Django dash dev IRC channel as well as no, in parallel to uh, dash, uh, hash Django users. Okay. It's, it's not as populated as Django users for obvious reasons, but, um, but it's, it's definitely there. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, is there? This is the first get off the bench talk since the move from some version to GitHub. So is there, uh, now I guess the, the new perennial question will be, any plans to move from track to the GitHub issue tracker? Okay, uh, no, and I can specifically say that one because Git, uh, uh, Git's ticket tracker doesn't let us do community gardening. Um, if I'm wrong, please, anyone who knows Git a lot better than me. Okay, so there we go. Um, Essentially, it, it, the, the, Git, the Git model, or the Git ticket model, says the people who are managers of the project are the only people who can move tickets around. And basically that doesn't work, because it means that I am responsible for every ticket change in the system, and that just ain't gonna scale. So um, we, need to, we, we need a model that works in aggregate, um, where anyone can do this community gardening. Um, Essentially, you know, it comes down to track is in no way a good ticket tracker, but any, it is the, it's the devil we know, it has problems that we know exist, and unless you can point at something that is clearly and obviously much better, it's basically gonna be a, non, a non-starter. Uh, and the Git tick track, ticket tracker would have been the obvious one to pick up on, but it just fails at that uh, organizational level, so. Cool, and that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Thank you.